Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I appreciate the opportunity of coming to your place of listening to try to be an inspiration to everyone. We do come as your prayers as we endeavor to get out the Word of God. And I'm hoping this message today will prove a real blessing to everyone. I'm bringing a series of messages on the uh, home, and I hope that the message I'm bringing on the home will be a blessing. I had message number 319, uh, termites in the home, and in message 320 it had to do with marriage, and in message chapter, uh, uh, message number 321 had to do with the, the husband's uh, responsibility, uh, more or less in the home, and so today we're going to talk about the wife's responsibility in the home, and I do trust that these series of messages will be a real blessing. Now, the Lord willing, next Sunday, I'm going to bring one other, which has to do with the family or the children in the home, and I'm sure that will be a blessing to everyone. Now, you can get these series of messages. You can get all uh, five of them. They're $3 each, and it can be a blessing. You can have your friends to listen to them. And if you write in and just request the messages on the home, uh, you might give the numbers. If you so desire, choose either one you want. That's 319, 320, 321, 322, 323, and 324. And so this message today will be uh, uh, message number 322. Uh, and uh, instead of uh, 324, it would be 323 next Sunday, the Lord willing. Now, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn, would you please, to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to have to do a little different on the program today because of a technical problem we had and recording the music and so forth. And there won't be any music heard on the broadcast today. I'll spend the entire time in preaching the Word of God. We appreciate music and know it's wonderful. It can be helpful. But due to fact a technical problem, we'll have to eliminate the music from this particular uh, tape today. So because of that, we'll have an opportunity to get more time in in the preaching of God's wonderful Word. And after all is said and done, although you appreciate music, I appreciate music. We thank God for the good singing we have at Northside. We praise God for our choir and for our special singers, and we love to hear them sing. But there's nothing in the world that will take the place of the preached Word of God. You know that, and I know that. And so we'll be giving our time today mainly to the preaching of God's Word. And I want you to turn, would you please, to... Ephesians chapter 5, but once again read the scripture there and turn to there while we while you're turning there Let me remind you that I've heard each day on this uh, radio station here in Athens uh, That's the uh, the big giant station WNGC 95.5 on the FM dial and we heard daily Monday through Saturday every day 12 o'clock noon and of course on Sunday morning we broadcast a Sunday morning program for 11 till 12. So you tell your friends and neighbors about it. And let me give you my mailing address. Some of you may not have my mailing address. That mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603. Now that's uh, Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603. You write to me today, and I appreciate it very much because it depends entirely upon the people that love God to help me keep this program on the air. So remember today, this is message number 322, uh, uh, and so uh, you can write in and say, Preach Edward Simon, message number 322, or the message pertaining to the wife's part in the home, and we'll endeavor to do that. And so my Bible is now open at Ephesians chapter 5, and let's begin reading with verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now God tells us there to be filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk in wine, or with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's command. Every Christian ought to be filled with the Spirit of God. And so there's, there's one reception of the Holy Spirit, but many fillings. You receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the moment that you're born again. But you can be filled over and over again in your sojourn for God. Now he gives us in the, the verses to follow uh, the example of a spirit-filled home. Because it deals with the family 
And in order to have a spirit-filled home and live a spirit-filled life, these things must characterize our homes. Now in verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now let me point out something here, will you please? In verse 19 of Ephesians 5, you have three different kinds of singing here. It's all scriptural. Let me tell you what it means. It says, speaking to yourselves in psalms. Now, Psalms there, of course, we find to be the Old Testament of Psalms that David wrote and others wrote in the Old Testament. Now, in, in olden days, they used to sing these Psalms, and some churches still do today, and some Christians, as they're speaking to themselves in Psalms, and then hymns. Now, the hymns are the ones you find in your songbooks, your hymnals that you find in your church whenever you reach and get that hymnal, and the song leader says, turn to page so-and-so, and let's sing this number. You're singing those hymns. And then there is spiritual songs, the Bible tells us here. And the spiritual songs has to do with the songs like the Blessed Hope Singers, uh, our trio, and other special singing groups. They sing spiritual songs in that respect. And so you find them all mentioned here in verse 19. And they all have their place in the Christian sojourn and in our churches today. And these had given thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Why you submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord? Now let me pause here just a moment and tell you that God wrote this book. You know that and I know that. And he said for the wise to submit themselves unto their own husbands as unto the Lord. I'm telling you what God said, not what Preach Edwards said, but what God said. And that's when God says it, then that's final, that's it. And so there's nothing dishonorable about a good wife submitting herself to her own husband. O-W-N, own. That's her own husband. He belongs to her. And when she submits to him, nothing dishonorable about that. That's where it should be. And then in verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So God plainly said here that the husband is the head. Somebody said, well, the husband is the head, but the neck is the wife, and the neck turns the head. Well, now that she should not be in the matter of serving God, in the matter of the home. The head should be the head of the home and ruling the home according to the Bible. And so it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present himself to a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. Sought men to love their wives as their own bodies, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nursed and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now let me pause here to comment briefly. I emphasized this last week, I believe, last Sunday. Telling you how when a couple gets married, how that they're to leave their father and mother and get out on their own and start their own home. That's God's plan for them. Leave father and mother and be joined unto the wife and they too should be one flesh. That doesn't mean that you disrespect your parents. Doesn't mean that you're not to be concerned about them and help them in time of need. But it means that you to get out and start your own home. Because if you're old enough to marry, then you're old enough to start your own home. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let everyone who protect the soul of his wife, even as himself and the wife, see that she reverence her husband. Now, chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, the Lord willing, this coming Sunday, I'll be dealing with that particular line of thought, the Sunday coming up. Uh, following this message. Now we want to talk about the wife's responsibility in the home. Now we noticed last Sunday, and I did not uh, say all I'd like to say about the man's responsibility in the home. And I want to mention just a word or two about that and then continue on about the wife's responsibility in the home and to her husband. 
Now the Bible, according to the Bible, the man is the head of his house. That word uh, husband means ban. He's the ban around the family, there in the home. He's the head. God holds him responsible for what takes place in that home. And that husband, of course, is made in the image of God. The Bible said the man is made in the image of God and the woman is made in the image of the man. Now what I'm saying here, there's no person in the home shall live any more clean, any more holy, any more pure, any more godly than that husband. Because he's made in the image of God and his wife's made in the image of man. So you must keep that in mind. That husband is set the example in holy living, in purity, in righteousness, in godliness, Bible reading, in prayer, and so forth. He is to set the example. He is to take the lead in these matters. Now God is holding you men responsible. He's looking down the gun barrel at you men. And you are held responsible for what takes place in your home. Now you must keep that in mind. A lot of men like to blame the devil off on their wives. I'll tell you, it kind of vexes me to see a big old 200 pound man blame all of his meanness and devil it off on his little 125 pound wife. Now that's not right. A man is to be responsible for what happens in his home. Now Adam tried that. That's as old as the hills. Now when Adam sinned in the garden and God came in the garden in the cool of the day and said, Adam, where art thou? God called Adam. And said, Adam, where are you? God was holding Adam responsible. And so God holds that man responsible. Now what did Adam do? He did like many men try to do today. He tried to blame it on his wife. He said, this woman thou gavest me. She's responsible for this. Now a lot of you men, bless your hearts, you blame your sins, your ungodliness, your evil ways on your wife. That's a shame. You're the head of your house. You're the man in your house. And you shouldn't blame devil it off on your little wife. God will hold you responsible. And the Bible said a man is to provide for his home. Let me say a word or two about that. And then we'll get around to the lady's place in the home. A man is to provide for his home. The Bible said if a man does provide for his home, he is worse than an infidel. Now did you get that? That's the word of God. If a man doesn't provide for his home... He is worse than an infidel. Now you may say, preacher, what is that provision? I believe that provision covers uh, many categories. I believe, number one, it covers spiritual provision. You ought to provide spiritual leadership. You ought to be willing to lead in prayer, lead in Bible reading, lead in spiritual matters in the home. And then it means provide the needs of that home. Now God said man is to earn his bread by the sweat of his face. And he's to go out and, and there earn his daily bread by working, by the job he operates. Now the man is responsible for providing food, providing clothing, and providing shelter for his family. God expects him to do that. Now it's good if a man could provide for the family without the wife having to work. But many times uh, wives have to work to help meet the expense and the bills to be paid because of the cost of high living and this day in which we live. But it's always better if the wife can remain at home, especially while you have children. If you have children, nobody can take the place of that mother in the home with those children. Now you can put them out in a place of caretaking for the little ones and nurses and so forth, but there's nothing in the world that'll take the place of that mother in the home with those children. Now if that husband can make a living and can get by, he would be far better off to go with less money and less of the things he'd like to have in this life and have his wife there with his children and it cost him less in that manner than it would be for others to take care of the children and the wife having to go to work. And I'm not critical toward women working. Uh, many of our women in our church, precious women, they have to work, they do work, and many of them want to work to help uh, earn money to take care of the family, to school the children. I understand that. I'm just telling you what is better for them to do. That is, if he didn't have to and could stay in the home, that would be much better. Now, a man is to provide for his home. He used to work and make a living, uh, provide the bread, the shelter, the clothes, and whatever's needed in that home. And God said if he doesn't do that, he's worse than infidel. There's been many of a wicked man that's gone into a good family and there secured a good girl to become his wife. And then uh, children came in that home and he's too lazy and sorry to work and provide for his family. His poor wife has to go to work and try to make a living for those children. That's dead wrong. 
that's sinful, that's weak in due time. God may deal with that man about that matter. He's shirking his responsibility. Many years ago, I was down in Millersville. I went with a man down there to secure a man out of the hospital down there. We had to go to the courthouse. We're sitting there in the courthouse waiting for this to be taken care of. Whenever a, a lawyer came in with a young man about uh, 26 years old, he was a black man, but that doesn't matter. It'd be the same, be the same if he was red, white, or, or, or yellow. Beloved, he came in with this man and walked up before the judge, and he said, Judge, Your Honor, sir, I have a man here. He has a wife and six children, and said he's too sorry, too lazy, no good to provide for his family. And the welfare is having to keep up his family. He won't give him a dime. He won't work. He won't help his family. And I think something ought to be done about it. And the judge said to the lawyer, he said, what do you think ought to be done? What do you recommend? He said, I think this man ought to be put in the stockade and work for the city. Now, if the welfare takes care of his family, then he ought to work for the city as long as he's too lazy and too sorry to provide for his family and the welfare has to keep his family up, then he ought to work uh, for the city of the county uh, until he's willing to go to work and provide for his family. And I was there in the courtroom, and I said a good hearty amen, and people turned and looked at him like they thought I was crazy, but I believe that. I'm for that 100%. If a man is too sorry and too lazy to work and provide for his family and the welfare, has to keep up his family. I think he ought to be put in, in the stockade or in prison and work for the city, work for the county if the county has to take care of his family. That'd be only fair. I'm for that 100%. All right, let's get around now to the wise place in the home. We thank God for our precious women. God uh, provided man with a woman. And the greatest, the last great gift from heaven for a man is a good wife. Now that wife is to take her place in the home and she is the queen in the home. Not a queen, but the queen. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, Thy desire is to be thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, I didn't write those words. God wrote them. God put them in the book. That's Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, Why submit yourselves unto your own husbands? as unto the Lord. God put that in the book. He said, if you wise to submit yourselves unto your own husbands. And then in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18, wise submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now you may say, preach Edwards, what is meant by the phrase as is fit in the Lord? Well, I explain to you what it means. Now, for instance, there's a good godly woman. She loves the Lord. She's a good wife. And she lives a clean, holy, pure life. And she has an ungodly husband that drinks and curses and gambles and, and does many things ungodly. And her husband tries to get her to go out and pitch a party and get drunk and go to the dance and carry on the evil manner. She has a perfect right on the authority of God's word to refuse to do so. The Bible says you to obey your husbands in the Lord, submit to them as it is fit in the Lord. If your husband asks you to do something that's not scriptural, do something contrary to the Word of God, uh, you need to do something you know is wrong, you have a perfect right to say to your husband, I respect you as my husband, but I love God and He's my Savior and my Lord, and I know it's wrong. I'm not going to drink whiskey. I'm not going to the dance. You've got a perfect right to refuse doing that for your husband. God tells you you to obey him and submit to him as is fit in the Lord. And any time he tells you to do something that's not fit in the Lord, you have a perfect right to say no. And God expects you to say no. I saw this happen in the city of Greenville, South Carolina, many years ago. There was a young man and his wife lived in that community. They were around the age 30, and she was saved. She's a member of the Westview Baptist Church, very faithful church member. And just about every Sunday, she requested prayer, requested prayer for that husband. He was lost. He had no time for God. He wouldn't come to church, wouldn't read the Bible. And she was burdened for him. She wanted him to be saved so badly. And so one day, he, uh, he said to her, he said, I'll tell you what. Uh, a husband said to her, said, if you'll go with me to the dance tonight and to the party, then uh, I'll go with you to church tomorrow. That was on Saturday. And she got to thinking about it. She said, I can't get my husband to church, but if I go with him to dance, he promised to go to church tomorrow. And maybe if he'll go to church, then God will get a hold of him. 
So she compromised. She went to the dance that night, and they danced and frocked around till about midnight and came home. The next morning she got up. She said, well, uh, let's get ready now and go to church. He said, uh, he said no, I'm not going. He said, uh, you, you're foolish to ask me to go. He said, I didn't have any confidence in you in the first place. And when you went to the dance with me last night, I lost all confidence in the world in your Christianity. Therefore, I will not go. And he refused to go. Later on, that man died. He died with a heart attack. And far as I know, he died without God. What are you saying, Preacher Edwards? I'm saying that that dear precious woman compromised to try to get her husband to go to church and lost him through compromising. Now, let me say something to you, dear ladies. You will never win your husband by compromising in a life of sin to do so. Oh, no, you can't compromise and win him. You must remain true to God. God expects you to do so, remain true to God, and let God lead and direct. If you read 1 Peter chapter 3, God will tell you there, give you some good scripture on how to win your husband to God. That's 1 Peter chapter 3. Read the first 8 or 10 verses. And so we find if you compromise, you don't do it. Not only that, but you don't drive your husband to God. A lot of men are hard-headed like a billy goat. Now you know what a billy goat is, and his head is hard. And I've oftentimes seen a billy goat run and butt his head against the wall. Have you ever seen that? Well, he's hard-headed. Now a lot of men are like that. They're hard-headed, and their wives cannot drive them to God. Now you might possibly lead them to God, but you can't drive them to God. Many men are stubborn and they're not going to do it. And so you can keep on trying to drive and trying to thread and push, but that won't work. A lot of women uh, fuss on their husband, tell them they're going to hell, they're no good, they're sorry, and they mean he's a devil, and, and they may be in hell before night, and all that kind of uh, threatening, but that'll not get the job done. You don't win your husband that way. you got to win your husband through love. If you win them through love, then of course, if you ever win them, it'll have to be through love. You're not going to do it by threatening and by trying to drive them to God. That just absolutely won't work. That's not the way to do it. You can win people through love when you can't win them any other way. I have a dear brother who's gone on to be with the Lord. And many, many years ago, I tried to uh, force him to come to God. I threatened him. I told him he's going to hell. I told him he needed to come to know Jesus. I told him that, that it's wrong for him to live a life like he was living. And I tried to drive him to God and threaten him to get him to come to God, but to no avail. One day, I put my arm around him, and I said, Listen, brother, I want you to know I love you, and you're precious to me. And I'd like to see you surrender to God. You know, he started crying fell down on his knees and humbled his heart before God. Oh, dear people, I tried to drive him, but to no avail. But when I decided to love and love him in, then it worked that way. You can love people when you can't drive them. You must remember that. And so a lot of you wives try to drive your husbands to God. You absolutely can't do that. God, you got to love them in, in that respect and, and be a, a real Christian around them. That's a man one time. He, uh, he went to a, a saloon where they gambled and cursed and where they carried on in a very ungodly way. And, and they began to talk about their wives. And about time to go home, some of the men said, Well, I kind of dread to go home because I know my wife's going to curse me. Others said, Well, my wife's going to do more than that. When I go home, she's going to take a broomstick after me. And on and on they went, telling what their wives would do when they arrived home. This man said, My wife won't do that. So when I go home... She'll be kind and nice, and she won't fuss on me, and, and uh, she, uh, she'll have a good attitude, and, and I can just go in just like I'd, I'd been to church someplace as far as the way she treated me. They said, we don't believe that. They said, we don't believe there's a woman that would do a thing like that toward an ungodly old drunken sot and gambler like you. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, if you don't believe it, you go home with me, and I'll prove it to you. They said, we will. We'll go home with you and see if you're telling us the truth. So they went home with him, and they walked up on the porch, and he tapped on the door, and she came to the door with a big smile and said, Come in, honey. And I said, uh, Who are these with you? She said, he said, These are my friends. And she said, Come on in. Come on in. We're glad to have you. Come into our home. Just as nice and humble and sweet as they could be. As she told him to go in and sit down, gave him a comfortable chair. Very nice to him. Talked to him just like they were angels almost. 
and very kind and very nice. And, and then a matter of a few minutes, she said, uh, have you all had supper? They said, no. She said, let me fix you a nice meal. And they didn't want to accept, but uh, uh, she persuaded them to stay and, and eat a good supper with them. She went in and spent some time providing a wonderful meal and just as kind and nice to those ungodly cussing gamblers and liquor heads as if she'd been to a preacher and very nice to them and fed them a wonderful meal and spoke kindly to them and uh, they couldn't get over it. And then after a while, it got next to them. They, they couldn't, couldn't resist it any longer. They said, we don't see how in the world a man could have a wife like that as ungodly as, as this man is and, and be so kind to us uh, as ungodly as we are. And the story goes that she won all of those men to God, uh, including her husband, and she did it through her kindness and being um, uh, courteous toward them and treating them like they were human beings. Now the wife is to be the queen in the home, the Bible tells us. She's not a queen. She is the queen in the home. Now you good, good ladies, remember that you're the queen in the home. You're not one of the queens. You're not a queen. You are the queen in the home. And the wife is to be the husband's wife. Now we have a lot of wives today, but it's not real good husband's wives. They're more concerned about outside things and more concerned about... Uh, the things in the house and things in town and things in the community than they are about their husband. And their husband is neglected many times. Number one, good ladies, you are to be your husband's wife first of all. You belong to him. You to take care of him. You to look to his needs and so forth. And everything else is to be secondary. That's a dear preacher one time. He, he said, you know, there's nothing come between me and my wife, not even my children. Said when we sit down at the table, my children don't sit between us. She sits by my side. When we get in my automobile, my children don't uh, sit between us. Uh, she uh, sits right, right by my side. My wife is number one. And you good wives, your husband, you to be your husband's wife. He comes first. You take care of his need and love him and be kind to him and toward him and, and see that his need is taken care of. Everything else be second. You to be the husband's wife. You have a lot of wives today. They're good housekeepers. They're good workers. They're good mamas. They're good mothers to the children, but they're not a good husband's wife. You need to be a husband's wife, number one. I know a dear woman, she had the prettiest yard you ever saw. Every time you saw her, she was out working in the garden, in the, in the yard with the flowers, and, and they were beautiful. Everybody that went by my those beautiful flowers. She spent all the time working on flowers. She spent no time with her husband. She spent no time providing for his need and care, and she finally uh, lost him. Some other woman came along and, and took him away. Now she was so busy taking care of the flowers in the, in the yard, beautifying the outside of the house. Honestly, she did not beautify herself for her husband and, and she lost him in time of it. Now you need to beautify number one, your husband's wife. Be your husband's wife, look your best and uh, beautify yourself. Be as pretty as you possibly can for your husband. Be as neat and as clean as you possibly can for your husband. Be as loving uh, toward your husband as you possibly can. Hug his neck, give him a big kiss once in a while, tell him how much you love him and how much you appreciate him. Now you can take care of everything around the house and neglect him when he's the most important person you have. A lot of women spend all their time with the children. They're caring for the children and they should be taken care of. But that husband needs to come first and never look after his needs. Beloved, you take care of your husband first and then the children because he's part of you and you're part of him. And you to be a husband's wife. That's right, not a, just a housewife, but a husband's wife. And you do that and you'll be glad that you did ere you travel on down life's highway. And then uh, you're to be a good housekeeper. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2 and verse 5, to be discreet, chaste, keep them at home, obedient to their own husbands, to love their children. So the Bible said here, you're to be a discreet, you're to be chaste, you're to be a keeper at home, obedience to your husband. That is, you're to be a good housekeeper. 
Now learn how to tidy up your house. There's a lot of women today, bless your heart, they never really tidy up their house and keep it as clean as it should. Your husband, when he comes in, he notices whether the bed's been made up or not, the floor's been swept, the dishes has been washed. A lot of women, they pile the dishes in the sink. They don't wash them. They won't make up the bed from one night to another. They won't sweep the floor about once a week. And the husband notices that. You ought to keep a clean, tidied up house for your husband's sake as well as your own. Be a good housekeeper. My wife is a good housekeeper in that respect. She tidies up a house. Any of you ever visited our home, you'll know my wife keeps the house tidied up. And I appreciate that. And there's some things in that house that only a woman can really handle in that respect. And that's the wife's responsibility. Now, a man can't very well tidy up a house. He's liable to pull the, a living room chair into the dining room or the bedroom chair into the kitchen and set the vase in the wrong place and put the picture. The, well, a husband can't tidy up a house like a woman can. And you to keep a good house, be a real good housekeeper. And you'll be glad. And look your best for your husband. And try as hard to keep him as you tried to get him. Now, if each man and wife would do that, if they would try as hard to keep each other as they tried to get each other, then we'd have no, be no broken homes and everything would be wonderful around the house. So you women have a great responsibility in the home and you need to do that. Now, you, whenever you married your husband, you took him for the better, and you took him for the worse. Now, you might figure you never get any better, and he couldn't get any worse. You just took him as he is, but uh, you need to uh, kind of take care of him, look after him. If he gets sick, it's your responsibility to look after him and help him. Do all you can for him. A good wife will stand by her companion, and you need to be a good husband's wife, because if you fail to do so, then it may cost you sometimes your husband or, or your home. There's a man one time, his wife uh, uh, was somewhat uh, in ill health, and he went to talk to the preacher about it. The preacher said, how long has it been since you took her in your arms and gave her a big hug and a big kiss and told you how much you loved her? Oh, he said, we stopped that when we got married. He said, yes, that's part of your trouble right there. You should uh, not do that. You should tell one another you love them, be kind, and, and uh, be, be good to each other. And he said, well, if that will help the matter, I'll, I think I'll try that. So he took off home, and when he walked in, she was busy there in the kitchen, and he just reached and threw his arms around her, hugged up real tight, gave her a big kiss, told her she is the prettiest thing he ever saw. He loved her uh, more than ever, and uh, just kept telling tell her these things. She started crying, and she said, oh, said, uh, said I know you're, you're a liar, you're telling a lie, but I sure do like to hear you tell them. Well, good wives like to hear their husbands tell them that they love them and that they mean it. Now, we need a lot of patience in our home today. You ought to be just as patient toward your wife as you were sitting on a fish bank waiting for fish to bite. While some of you go to a fish bank, and a, a river bank, and, and sit out there with a fish hook and wait for hours for a fish to bite. Got all the patience in the world, but you don't have any patience with your wife. You quarrel, you snap at her, you growl, and a lot of wives the same way, always quarreling and fussed at the husband, slapping the children around, but they can sit down and look at TV, got all kind of patience to do it, look at these soap operas, and look at them hours at a time. But no patience with their husbands, no patience with their children. You need to learn to have some patience. It goes a long way in the home. Good old patience will go a long, long way. There was a great preacher one time, that was pastoring out in the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. Very humble man, very kind man, a very patient man. And uh, back in those days, whenever somebody called you on the phone, they got to operate, the operator then got the person. And so this preacher went to bed one Saturday night about 12 o'clock. And usually if a preacher needs a good night's rest, it's on Saturday night because of his heavy duty on Sunday. And he needs to get some rest. And so he went to bed and it was about midnight and, and he just kind of dozed off to sleep and the phone rang. The phone was down in the office, but he could hear it. And he was sleeping upstairs. He got up, went down the steps, went down and answered the phone. He said, hello. And the operator said, uh, this so-and-so. He said, no, this is, um, this is the doctor so-and-so, preacher so-and-so. She said, I'm sorry. 
said, I'm awfully sorry. I said, uh, I, I rung the wrong number. I said, I'm sorry, uh, minister. I hated to disturb you. He said, never mind, little lady. No harm done. And he went back upstairs, went to bed. Well, about a matter of 15 minutes after he dozed off sleep, phone rang again. He got up, he went down the steps, went down to his study, picked up the phone. It was that same operator. She had dialed the wrong number again. Oh, how she apologized to the preacher. She said, I'm so sorry, sir. Won't you please forgive me? I, I don't know what's wrong with me tonight. I, I didn't intend to do that. The second time I've disturbed your rest. He said, little lady, said, don't mind that. Said, no harm done. Just don't worry about it. And he went back upstairs with the bed. Long about one o'clock, that phone rang again. And he got up. He went down the steps, went down into the study, picked it up. And lo and behold, it was that same operator. Now you talk about apologizing and pleading. She said, sir, sir, I'm so sorry. You just don't know how sorry I am. This is the third time I rang this wrong number, and I'm sure I must have gotten you out of the bed, and I'm so sorry. He said, little lady, said, don't worry about that. Said, no harm done. And he went back upstairs, went to bed. And that girl got to thinking about that. The next morning she got up, she couldn't get off her mind. She said, that's the most patient man I've ever seen. As a general rule, I'd be cursed out for doing a thing like that. And, and said, that man was so kind and nice and seemed to have so much patience. I think I'll go here and preach this morning. And she dressed herself and she went to the First Baptist Church in, in Dallas, Texas. And went in and sat down to hear this man preach. And he got up and preached. And, and she sat there and listened. And God spoke to her heart. And she, when the invitation was given, she was the first one down that aisle to give her heart to Jesus. And God saved her because that man, that preacher, had patience the night before to be kind toward a person that had made that mistake. Beloved, we need to be kind one toward another. The Bible says, be ye kind toward each other. And that we need to do, be kind toward each other. And so you wives, be kind to your husband. Be kind to your children. Be kind one toward another. And then remember, I told you this on some, a couple of weeks ago about the good old-fashioned doctor in Atlanta, Georgia. My wife goes to him for a checkup, and he lost his wife not too long ago, and he's getting up in years. He and his wife are very close, and he lost his wife. She is a good Christian woman, and he loved to deal it. And my wife went in the office. He's sitting there, and he looks so sad and, and kind of pitiful, knowing his wife is gone. And you know what he said to my wife? He said to Mrs. Edwards, he said, You and Brother Edwards ought to live together every day like it was your last day together upon the earth. You know, I'll never forget that. Oh, Mrs. Edwards, you and Brother Edwards ought to live together every day like it was your last day together upon the earth. Now listen, dear people, that's coming one of these days. That's coming a time when you and your companion will live together your last day together upon the earth. Somebody's going out to eternity to meet God if Jesus tears his coming. And you don't know what day that's going to be. That's why the good doctor said we ought to live every day as though it was our last day upon the earth. Are you saved today? Are you the right kind of wife? Are you a good husband's wife? Good mother? Good neighbor? I hope so. Mainly, are you a Christian? You know the Lord Jesus. I hope you do. If you don't, you ought to repent right now and turn to God because you never know when it's too late. Now remember this message I've just brought. It's on cassette tape number 322. You can write in and get it by sending a gift three dollars. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, Post Office Box 501 Athens, Georgia 30603 is the zip code number. And I hope that this message will be a blessing to you as you've listened to it. Our Father, I pray now that you'll take the message, use it to thy glory. May thy name be honored. May Jesus be glorified because we pray in his name and for his sake. Amen.